Hello, and welcome to the Project Good podcast. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Hilton. Project Good is a social impact podcast interviewing experts and advocates about the pressing problems that we face globally and hearing how they suggest we move forward in the future. The Project Good podcast is brought to you by Project Good Work. The goal of this podcast is to inspire people and organizations to develop a mindset that can move others to positive action regarding the complex social issues facing people and the planet. For October, we're focusing on modern philanthropy. When people hear the word philanthropy, they often think of wealthy individuals who give to a cause that they love or inspires them. Also, there's often an image of a philanthropist being a well-to-do white male or female, which often leaves other groups of people feeling left out. What if that image could change today? No matter what your social or economic level you find yourself, you become the philanthropist you've always dreamed of. It's possible. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Sara Lomelin, who is turning the world of philanthropy on its head, and in the process, breaking the power dynamic between who gives and who receives. Sara is the founding CEO of Philanthropy Together, an organization advocating collective giving, and on a mission to bring more people and diverse perspectives into philanthropy while taking people and issues from the margins and putting them in the center. Let's get into the interview. For far too long, philanthropy has been a select few deciding the impact of many. And this mismatched dynamic of decision-making has greatly impacted the issues that receive funding. In the U.S., communities of color receive just 8% of philanthropy funding. Women and girls' causes make up only 1.9%. And for every $100 awarded, only $0.23 cents supports the LGBTQ plus community. Sara Lola Lin, who is the founding CEO of Philanthropy Together, is a firm believer that everyone can be a philanthropist. A self-proclaimed philanthropy disruptor, Sara has traveled the world speaking about the power of collective giving and the correlation between civic engagement and Latino philanthropy. She's an expert in diversifying philanthropy. As founding CEO of Philanthropy Together, Sara is growing a movement of people-powered philanthropy to resource grassroots nonprofits, shift power dynamics, and promote widespread philanthropy. Sara is frequently featured on high-profile conferences and events for innovative leaders and big ideas including TED 2022, Netroots Nation, and Unity Summit. An expert on the future of philanthropy, Sara often quoted in, is often quoted in news outlets, including Forbes, the Associated Press, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and her writing appears in Ms. Magazine and Philanthropy Women. Her work shows how philanthropy is about the love of humanity. Welcome, Sara. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I am so, so thrilled to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. I am thrilled to uh, speak with you as well. Um, you know, I, I, I fell in love. Um, well, I listened to your uh, TED Talk, but I also just fell in love with the, I guess I'll just call it the realness of you. <laughs> um, because, you know, some, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes in the philanthropy space, um, it has kind of a, um, you know, uh, untouchable image. And so I loved, um, you know, listening to you and learning about you um, because you made it accessible. And also just like, uh, you know, I guess I'll use the, the Oprah f- phrase that everybody loves to use, gave me aha moments continuously because I was like, yes, this is, oh what it, this is what it's really, really about. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, I I, I feel <laughs> I feel that um, you know as a, as an immigrant, right? Like you know, to start with that, uh, English is my second language. So uh, my vocabulary in English is not as rich as I would like it to be. So um, I basically use very simple words that resonate with everybody because I feel that. You know, our field, the field of philanthropy, needs to be a lot more accessible, needs to be more approachable. And as you say, it doesn't, we need to debunk that, that idea that you need to be 
a, a millionaire in your 60s um, to be a philanthropist. Yes. And so, you know, I was just interested, how did you, um, you know, or what drove you, I guess, to get into philanthropy, uh, the whole philanthropy space as a career? Um, well, you know, I have reinvented myself um, several times. And my career in philanthropy started uh, when I turned 40 years old. Um, so I was living at that moment well, before that, I was living in, in Dallas, Texas, uh, with a group of friends, uh, most of them uh, immigrants from Mexico and Latin America. We started a giving circle without even knowing that that was called a giving circle. And then in 2010, I came back to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, because, you know, I, I have been here in the U.S. for 26 years. So, yeah, this accent is here to, to stay. It's not that I just, uh, you know, arrived a few years ago. It's here to stay. So in 2010, when I came back to the to the Bay Area, um, there was an incredible opportunity to join the Latino Community Foundation in San Francisco um, as a development uh, person. So from day one, I started... Um, learning and literally, you know, falling in love with um, collective giving because as a way to create uh, a community of supporters for the Latino Community Foundation, uh, we started as a giving circle in, in 2012 uh, with a group of 16 women that, you know, got together and uh, pulled their money together and decided to take action. So that's how I started my, my career. Um, and if you want, I can tell you how Philanthropy Together came about because that's a good story too. Yes, I would love to. Actually, that was, the, that was my next question. Um, so, you know, um, from there, how did uh, Philanthropy Together get started? Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, Philanthropy Together, we are on a mission to democratize and diversify philanthropy globally. Um, in order to expand who I want gets funded, right? Um, so we do a lot of storytelling, training, research, and advocacy, um, you know, to try to usher a new era of philanthropy that is democratic and it's diverse and it's powered by people acting in, you know, solidarity, regular people. So what um, sparked this idea? During my, my years at Latino Community Foundation, um, I uh, got, you know, the, the great privilege of meeting few women doing the same kind of work that I was doing with Latino communities uh, in other communities. So I met Marsha Morgan from the Community Investment Network, a network of um, Black and people of color giving circles in the South. I met Kali Lee from the Asian American, um, uh, the Asian American Women's Giving Circle, I met at that point Joel Berman from Amplifier and Celicia Herman from Amplifier, a network of uh, giving circles based on Jewish values. Um, and I met uh, Diane Chips Bailey from uh, what is now Philanos, which is a, a really large network of women's giving circles. So in 2007, all of them were together at the um, uh, Women's Philanthropy Institute Symposium in Chicago. I couldn't go there. But they called me and they say, hey, why? There is nothing like this kind of symposium for people that are involved in giving circles. Um, we just spoke with, you know, Victoria Brana from the Gates Foundation. And she's willing to give us a small gift to get some um, giving circle network leaders together so we can dream big, what is need, what, what do we need for a field of collective giving? So in 2007, I'm sorry, I said 2007, and it's not 2007, it's 2017. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so at the end of 2000, yeah, at the end of 2017, um, a group of about 50 people, we got together in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, during a couple of days, and we were brainstorming, right? What do we need for the field? And we saw that, you know, the, the giving circle field is extremely diverse. There were networks that were very sophisticated. 
There were networks that were very simple in their models, et cetera, et cetera. So after those two days, we went back to the Gates Foundation and we said, we need something as a field. Definitely we need something, but we need more time to figure out exactly what is that that we need. So we embarked in a full year of a co-design project. And I was part of that core team of um, six women uh, that were representing the different um, giving circle networks. But we included during that year of co-designing more than 100 voices. We wanted to get everyone's input and voices, you know, through giving circle uh, model. So we um, conducted several um, hour long Zoom interviews before Zoom was even, you know, popular. We did uh, working groups and then we ended up with a convening of a hundred people at the Gates Foundation uh, with a room full of post-it notes. And um, after the year, we went back to the Gates Foundation with this beautiful business plan for uh, a five-year initiative to um, democratize and diversify, you know, the, the giving circle field to support and strengthen the, the collective giving field. So the Gates Foundation loved it and they gave us a seed grant. And um, we started, you know, um, the, 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 the job of finding more money, uh, looking for someone to lead this initiative. And at that point, I decided to put my name in the hat. And uh, after a very, you know, extensive um, search, I, I ended up with a job and I, you know, I have the best job in the world. So we launched uh, Philanthropy Together on April 1st, 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have to laugh because yeah. everybody knows 2020 was like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and, but you know what? I think looking back, I know at that moment, you know, we, um, I thought, oh my God, what is going to happen, right? And we didn't know if we were going to be inside our homes for two weeks or a month or what. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, it was the perfect moment for us to start Philanthropy Together because by design, our team was going to be distributed around the country. And then so, and, and all of our programs, because our, our field is everywhere, right? There are given circle members everywhere. So all of our programming was going to be virtual no matter what. So for us, um, COVID, uh, the pandemic um, helped in getting everybody tech savvy, right? A big, you know, a big chunk of our, of our members, of Giving Circle members uh, were not very tech savvy before uh, the pandemic. And everybody learned how to use Zoom. Everybody learned how to use different platforms. So suddenly after a couple of months, um, we were putting programming out and we said, wait a second, we were here to support the American Giving Circle field. And we have people from Germany and Chile and China and Australia joining our program. So I guess you know, there is this appetite all over the world. So we, you know, at that moment, we said, okay, we are a global organization that is strengthening and supporting the, the Giving Circle movement. Yes, and I, I love it. I, I love it because it, it speaks to, you know, first, I guess I'll start at the beginning of what's going on in my brain, but like the 2020, it's like, you are right that it was the perfect time because, in this period of, I guess, how many years has it been now? Four or five <laughs> since uh, 2020 here that we are, we're at. Three, but it feels for it. Yeah, I was like, I was 2020. I was like, what year are we on? We're in 2023. I was like, but it feels like four or five years have passed. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm like, I had a baby, a pandemic baby. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> in, this, right. in this time. But, um, you know, uh, so a lot happened um, during that that period, but with 2020, ironically and not ironically, just like vision, it gave us clear, 
a clear vision of what we had created this essentially, I guess, world to be and the mess that we were in, right? And how many things, um, you know, were were running awry and, um, you know, how people were hurting. And it became so amplified um, that I you, I think you're 110% right that it was the perfect time because then it started to show how these things that had not been funded properly, for instance, education, right? Because now parents had to take on the role of being, you know, uh, really a co-educator of their kid within, uh, you know, because uh, students had yeah. to stay at home. And so things that had not been properly funded in um, some areas like education. So some schools had access to uh, technology they could take home. Some people did not. And, you know, the ones that did not, uh, you know, the students started to fall behind. Also, um, uh, the food, uh, you know, having access to food, um, how some people had access, some didn't. It just, it blew the door open to show where things were not being taken care of. That's, you know, that's what I believe 2020 did. And, you know, irony or not irony, like 2020 vision, it gives us a clear vision into where we were falling, where we were, where, where we were falling short as, as uh, you know, as a society. Um, so, yes, I think uh, perfect time for philanthropy together to start. And then the other thing that you just touched on that I think um, really became um, evident, not that it uh, didn't exist before, but I believe um, a majority of people or a good amount of people were not thinking this way, is that we really are so interconnected, right? And and, and and that was not something, that was not, I don't think that was the like frame of mind um, going into the pandemic. People were not, um, you know, they didn't see that we were so interconnected and it, it that's another thing the pandemic um, opened. And because of this, um, how you just talked about how you instantly um, sort of became an, a global organization because of all these things that just like, you know, compiled on each other. Um, uh, you know, uh, yes, oh, yes. And also <laughs> I think, and Mary, that, that um, you know, during the pandemic, as you said, like we, all of us were stuck at home thinking, what is mine to give, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, what can I do so I don't feel helpless, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we saw a big, uh, you know, boom of mutual aid societies, right? That have existed forever. And, you know, community philanthropy, like giving circles are part of community philanthropy. And what I always say, is like, this is not new. When people tell me, oh, what you guys are doing is really innovative, innovative. And I'm like, this is not innovative, people. This is going back to basics. Community philanthropy has always existed all over the world. I mean, the whole idea of people banding together to create good in the world and to helping one another has always existed. And I feel that the moment of the pandemic, many, many people said, okay, Yes, I'm stuck here. What can I do to help my neighbor? How, if I go to the grocery store, maybe I can bring, you know, my my um, older neighbor uh, their groceries. I can do this and that. Like, I feel that it was a moment uh, where there was a lot of solidarity that was sparked. And now, you know, my wish is that solidarity keeps going and we don't forget. Yes, of course. Yes. And uh, yes. And I, I, I wish that definitely too. And so, you know, being that now we've had that, uh, you know, that, that moment that brought all that to the forefront, how, I guess, how do we, I guess, keep that going? What's, I guess my question is how do we, what is that missing link that we've had between the communities, the organizations and the, uh, the funders and how do we, um, you know, uh, create those links? I, you know, I would say, and, you know, sometimes it sounds naive, but it's not. It's all about relationships, right? We need to move from the transaction to the looking at the human being in front of us. Um, you know, when, when I, uh, in my years at Latino Community Foundation, uh, a dear friend, a colleague of mine always said, we need to fund organizations 
like we are funding our family. We need to look at that nonprofit leader like if that nonprofit leader is our brother, our sister, our cousin. When you look people in the eyes, the whole relationship changes and you create trust. And I feel that is the link that we need to bring to the forefront, right? Between funders, organizations, regular people is trust. And the, the, the way you build trust is through relationships and to, uh, by no, not rushing things, by literally take the time to say, hey, Anne-Marie, how are you? You know, how are you feeling today? How's your, how, how's your kid? Like, I feel that it's important for us to, um, to come with a full self in every interaction that we have. Yes, and I think, uh, you know, the, what you talk about, the, re the relationship, and I think that's the thing that we've seen, um, and I'm, I'm just taking from, you know, the news and then just what, you know, I, I see from a, a personal uh, uh, basis out in, you know, just shopping or hanging out in the world, is that um, there, the other thing that that happened is there's, this other, um, I guess, uh, dehumanizing um, factor in people that people are just um, uh, not looking, I guess, um, yeah, not looking at people as individuals and um, being able to, I guess, get people to that, that, that mind frame um, that, you know, this person is, you know, a, a human just like you, I guess. Um, that yeah. is that that to me that has always been I guess the the hardest <laughs> thing across the board to teach people like the other person is a person and a human just like you yeah and I, I you know um, I, I at least uh, that's what I think is the always the 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 barrier I I don't know how to um, to ever get people to think past that. Um, Totally. And and so, you know, the other thing, of course, that has uh, exploded during this time um, was uh, uh, DEI. And I'm, I'm taking that, uh, you know, we just talked about being able to see people that they are a person like you. I wanted to talk about because the the communities that get, um, you know, the least funding are um, communities that are diverse communities of color. Um, and so a lot of people, I think, uh, don't think um, that, you know, um, DEI issues and philanthropy relate. And, um, you know, uh, I guess not to sound, uh, I don't know if cliche is the right word, but, you know, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, we're we're funding, you know, people in, in Africa, so we are touching people of color. That's, you know, that's how people always think. Like every time... <laughs> Anytime I talk to people of philanthropy, they feel that they, you know, once they start funding Africa, they've done, they've reached the pinnacle of philanthropy. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why that's like, uh, you know, there's like different levels like, okay, yeah, I helped the, you know, my child's school that's, you know, uh, level, level C, right? Then, you know, I, I donate to an organization within my community level B. But if I get to donate to Africa, I am level A philanthropist. I, I know it sounds, but that's how I always like every time when I talk to people, you know, um, whenever they bring up like, oh, I'm donating to Africa. I always feel like they have like this, like, you know, gold star. Like I, I, I reached level A in philanthropy. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, you're totally right. And I feel that, you know, that is why I love giving circles because, you know, uh, most of giving circles give locally. Um, because it, it, because uh, giving circles, you know, we, we, in giving circle lingo, we call it giving your five T's, right? So you go beyond the dollar. You give your treasure, which is your money. You give your time. You give your talent. You give your testimony and you give your ties. And in order to do all of this, you know, it's, it's better when you, when it's local. And I feel that that is something, um, something that you were mentioning too, right? Like not only supporting uh, organizations led by people of color, but grassroots organizations, those tiny organizations 
that are always underfunded by traditional philanthropy and by big philanthropy because they're too small, right? Mm-hmm. Those uh, organizations that a big foundation is not even aware of them. So that is why I like giving circles because giving circles uh, are really, you know, they play this role of seed funders in a lot of these grassroots nonprofits. Uh, you know, a group of people get together and say, okay, what is going on in our community? These are the challenges. And these are the, the small organizations that are, you know, making a dent in this challenge. So they get to support those tiny nonprofits. And by doing that, then that nonprofit can leverage that money and maximize that money because they can go and then tell, let's say, to a business or a foundation, hmm, you know, Giving Circle a X, Y, and Z has been supporting us for the last three years. It's like a seal of approval. It's like that middle ground between having individual donors and then jumping through having corporate money or uh, foundation money. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I feel that we, and you mentioned these stats at the beginning of the, of the show, right? Um, in the U.S., yes, only communities of color receive only 8% of philanthropy, which should be infuriating for all of us. And in 2020, nearly of all the, you know, 470-something billion donated to nonprofits, all that money went to just 5%, all nonprofits in the U.S., so most of that money went to just 5% of nonprofit. So that leaves 95% of the sector completely overlooked and underinvested. And you're right, the majority of those small grassroots nonprofits are led by people of color and serving people of color. So where I see giving circles changing that is, is we don't have to, we don't have to wait for a foundation or a you know, a billionaire to come and, and do the work. We can all take action. We can all, you know, get together and make a difference. Yes. And another point that you brought up that I I, I was uh, falling in love with is that you brought up um, something I think people don't think of in philanthropy. Most people are just thinking about dollars, but before they think about, you know, I'm going to give, you know, a thousand dollars or or something, um, as really looking at who you're giving to, why you're giving to, and also putting your whole self into it. Um, and, you know, you, you express that, it, you know, um, your, your five T's of, you know, it's your time, it's your talent, um, that it is really being invested in what you are funding. It's not just, uh, you know, a, a feel good moment for you. And that really does make the difference. You know, yes, we can give money, money. Yes, we know money is uh, important and needed. And, uh, you know, how we do transactions on the the planet. But the thing that is really going to fuel um, not only, I would say, the money itself, but in order to make the change that you are funding is really devoting yourself in a a different type of way and looking at those, you know, five elements that you discuss before you, I guess, jump in and choose what you're going to fund. Um, totally. I, I, yeah. I, totally. Uh, yeah. I, I, I love that you, you brought that up because I think people don't, they just look like, Oh, if I can give, you know, $5 here, $10, a thousand. Okay. I'm doing something, but don't instead of just, you know, throwing money at it because money is not the thing that's going to fix all these problems. It's about really taking, I know it has become a bad word in society, ownership. <laughs> <laughs> um, ownership of these issues. Because even if we think that we have nothing to do with the issue, if we really start to look at the issue deeply. We are all attached to it in some way or other. <laughs> yes, you're 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 totally right. And you know, um, yeah, something that I mentioned in the TED talk is is that right? Like all the money in the world is not going to save us, but you know, it's people, beloved communities will, and we need. We cannot afford to have 
generations of young people not engaged in in society, in in civic society, in social impact. Um, there's, you know, less and less people going to church. And what church or temple or synagogue provide to people is also this sense of belonging, this sense of community. And that is something that giving circles provide, right? Um, we, uh, we always, um, in all of our trainings, uh, talk about, you know, some of the challenges of modern society that giving circles um, attack. And one of that, one of them is, is loneliness, right? Um, in a given circle, you are also creating relationships with, you know, other, other people, uh, you know, that have the same values as you. You can be completely different and you can think completely different and, and maybe, you know, across the aisle politically, but you both care about the same cause and you can get, you know, behind the same cause because, you know, you value that. So I, I do feel exactly what you said. It's like money is one element, but it's not the most important. What we need is not be indifferent. We need to, as you said, take ownership and say, I need to do something. I cannot say, oh, someone else is going to be taking care of this. We all need to be taking care of everything that is going around us because as you well said it, all the issues that affect one part of our society are affecting us all. Yes, indeed, they are. Um, yeah, because I even, um, you know, I even had a, an episode on like human trafficking. And everybody would be like, I have nothing to do with that, <laughs> right? Because nobody wants to think of that one. Um, but I was like, you don't know, the person next door <laughs> could be going through some stuff. Um, you know, uh, so yes, every issue that we think has nothing to, um, no attachment to us really, really does in some way. And so one of the things, um, uh, I guess just to get, uh, practical and practical tips, uh, for what organizations, um, can do. So I guess for organizations that are looking for, um, you know, how do they, or I guess I would say uh, giving circles plus, uh, I guess, organizations too, how can they, um, you know, uh, start to um, be certain that they can secure funding? Um, and what I mean, I know in the giving circle, people are like, I'll, I'll give, you know, a hundred bucks and it adds up, um, you know, if you have uh, like a hundred people doing that. But um, how can organizations uh, present themselves, I guess, um, uh, in a better way to ensure that they uh, get funded? I know that's a big question. That's kind of like... Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a million dollar question. Yes. Uh, you no, know, I think, I think you know, and that is something that, um, don't get me started with the whole, you know, system of philanthropy, right? Um, when I talk, when I speak with a lot of executive directors from nonprofits, we always said like, my God, the things that I could be doing if I didn't have to devote so much of my time to fundraising. Um, and I have been in development in, in fundraising for many, many years. And going back to what you said, my realness, my realness came also from not being uh, formally trained as a fundraiser. So I was trying different things and seeing what was working, right? And something that I feel it's extremely important for an organization is to diversify your funding uh, sources, right? I know there are 24 hours in the day. I know uh, many organizations are focused on the big gifts, right? The major donor. Like if someone can give me $100,000 dollars, I'm going to focus on that person instead of, you know, creating a campaign to involve, you know, a, a, a thousand people that are going to give a um, hundred. I would say yes and. We cannot overlook the importance of involving everyday givers. Because by, especially, you know, when you are engaging um, diverse communities, young people, 
we are creating this culture of philanthropy. We are engaging little by little, you know, young people into giving, into being passionate about um, the mission of our organization. So yes, you know, keep doing your um, major donor uh, strategy, but also focus and, 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 and diversify your funding. Because what is the risk of just focusing on the big gifts? The moment one of your major donors decide that they, they want to support another cause or, you know, they go, something happened in their lives that they're not able to support you anymore, you are in trouble. You are in big, big trouble because, you know, suddenly a big percentage of your funding goes away. If you devoted also your time in creating a big, a large number of people that are passionate about your organization and are supporting your organization every month with, you know, with small gifts here and there, you are not as dependent on the, on a, on a, on a big gift when you lose one. Um, so I think, you know, that is something that I cannot stress enough, the importance of diversifying funding revenues. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the giving circles, oh my God, there are so many examples, right? There are giving circles. Of course, the money mostly comes from the members, but there are giving circles that, oh, apart from the money that they put, they organize um, campaigns, they do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, they will organize, you know, a happy hour at a restaurant. And, you know, maybe that restaurant is going to give a percentage of the sales to them. So there are many ways on how giving circles, you know, grow that uh, pot of money, right? Also, um, and this it, it shocks me that some people don't know that maybe your employer or your partner's employer has a match, right? So never leave money on the table, people. Like a, <laughs> inquire in your job if there is a match, um, because you can, you know, maximize the money that you that you are giving to an organization that you that you care about. Yes, and then on this on the another thing that um, becomes like a, a a big question, or um, or I guess it's not really a question, but a, a challenge, I should say is um, within the philanthropy, uh, you know, within philanthropy and the organizations, uh, one of the things that, um, that organizations face is uh, respecting uh, what the donors intend and then also addressing the actual needs of the community. So, for example, okay, the donor says, uh, I'm taking schools because they're easy to understand. <laughs> um and uh, let's say the yeah. donor says, uh, you know, um, I want to pay for 10 new computers for the students, right? But let's say, you know, last year we just got a grant for 10, uh, you know, 10 new computers. But the kids really need now is that they need to go out and they need to have, you know, um, hands-on uh, STEM education, right? And so how do we then deal with, okay, the donor wants us to use the money for this, but the community really needs this. How do we, um, I think that's a, a, um, something that uh, continuously happens is like getting the donors to understand, well, it's nice that you would like it to go here, but we really need it to go here. Yes, totally. And I feel that I go back to creating authentic relationships, right? We cannot treat donors as checkbooks or transactions. We as fundraisers need to uh, build a relationship, an authentic relationship with our donors. And, you know, as a fundraiser, you need to um, listen more than talk. And it's all, and, and, and also think that a lot of the work you do is donor education, because as you said, like, by sitting down without the donor and saying, you know, we're extremely grateful for your support. And we have that, we know you, you support, you know, you are all about technology and, you know, getting uh, uh, kids, um, you know, in, in, in STEM. And we also, we have the, the computers covered, but we have this program that is also part of our STEM education that needs funding and we would really appreciate. I feel that everything is about the conversation. 
And there is a lot of donor education. And for all of you listening that are donors, please, please, please try to give general unrestricted money. Because at the end of the day, we as donors don't know what the community needs. Those nonprofit leaders on the ground, they are the ones that know what their community needs. So let us be, you know, join them in supporting their needs, but taking, you know, taking a step back and and and, and just trusting again. Yes, I love it. The trust. Yeah, just trust. Trust they know what they need. <laughs> yes. That's, and that goes right back to your thing of looking at people and individuals. You know, we always, uh, I guess it's the same thing. Um, uh, like uh, I uh, used to know somebody that used to tell me the saying all the time. It would be like, everybody knows what you need, but nobody knows what they need. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Right. And so, you know, let people, let people, uh, you know, um, figure out what they, what they need. (laughs) Um, And so uh, I have uh, three more questions to ask you. They're uh, uh, practical to get people um, started. So one of the first thing is, uh, first things is that um, people encounter uh, barriers, I would say. Um, uh, and what would you say those barriers are for, um, I guess, just a regular individual to start seeing themselves as a philanthropist? I think the, the worth is really charged, right? Um, actually in my base at Latino community foundation, when I used to tell some people like, yes, you know, you are a philanthropist, there was this woman that really got offended and she said, don't call me that. And I said, why not? And she said, I am not, you know, someone that comes here and patronize other people and things that they know everything, what they need. Blah, 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 blah. So the, the, I, I had to say like, no, 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 no. Like, be, you know, forgive me if you thought that I was calling you a philanthropist in that way. I am calling you a, a philanthropist of going back to the roots of the world, right? Love of humanity. And I feel that that is what we need to do. It's like, you know, go back to the roots of the of the actual world. When we were about to launch uh, Philanthropy Together, we didn't have a name. Like during all this co-design um, time, um, we had the super sexy name of the backbone infrastructure project. I mean, it's like horror, <laughs> right? It's like, what is that? I don't want... Like, who wants to be part of that? So, um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we uh, we were going back and forth. Like, what what should be our name? Do we have like a campaign name? Do we have like an actual name? And then we decided to have the word philanthropy in the name, very intentionally. And you know, some people said, like marketing people said, like philanthropy together is very long it's the very difficult to write like you know the word philanthropy is difficult to spell (laughs) Um, those emails are going to be so long blah 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 and we said you know what it doesn't matter we need to have the word philanthropy in our name because we are reclaiming the word and saying philanthropy is about you take you know loving humanity so that's the whole message. I do feel, and, and yes, you know, I, I totally agree with you. There's a lot of people that don't like that word. It's, it's very charged. And little by little, you know, by, you know, being in, in, in a podcast like yours, by, you know, writing an op-ed, by, you know, doing social, like writing social media, we're trying to say, hey, yes, you are a philanthropist. Being a philanthropist doesn't mean you have to be patronizing or you have to be, you know, a white man in their 60s with tons of money. You can be 18 years old, just, you know, uh, finishing high school, um, get together with your friends and you are a philanthropist. So, um, yeah, I feel that that is the, that is the, the, the main part. Also, people get caught up in the, the word philanthropy sounds like a ton, like a lot of money. Right. Mm-hmm. And some people get discouraged because they said, 
okay, what are my twenty dollars going to to do for climate justice? Right, like it's just twenty dollars, and the and the problem is huge. Guess what? We all need to be part of it, part of the solution. And we, I mean, you coming together with your friends, then that those twenty dollars start start to multiply, right? And again, as you were saying, the money is. It's one aspect, but your voice, our voices, the advocacy that we can do for the causes that we care about, that is huge. How can we amplify the voices of those organizations that we care about? How can we open doors for them? Um, I have so many, you know, stories um, through, you know, for all the, the, through all the giving circles that I that I have uh, met in these, you know, past 12 years. Um, for a lot of organizations, the doors that Giving Circle members have opened for them are, you know, 10,000 times more important than the actual cash that went to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and so how, I guess, for the, the for the re- how I guess on uh, the next practical question is how do we get started with a giving circle? Like, um, how do we even uh, join one, or do we just start one ourselves? Awesome question. Okay, so in our on our website philanthropytogether.org, I know it's long. Um, there is a directory of giving circles. So we have the global directory of giving circles. There, there are more than three thousand giving circles listed. Um, you can put your zip code, you can put a keyword, you can put a cause that you care about, and you are going to find giving circles near you. If you don't find any giving circle near you or you want to start your own, please join us. Like every, every month, we have a training program called Launchpad for You. So Launchpad for You is a 90-minute webinar. It's free. I want to say that all of our all of our programs are free of charge. So everything that you can find on our website is free. Um, so that 90 minute program, you are going to learn and we're going to give you a digital toolkit with everything that you need to start your own giving circle. And after that, even you know, after the 90 minutes, you're kind of like, mm, I don't know, I feel kind of, you know, I don't know where to start really. Um, you are invited to join our, you know, monthly uh, group coaching with Aisha Wilson, our amazing director of engagement. Um, you become part of the Philanthropy Together family. We have, you know, a, a YouTube channel full of videos with practical tips. We have a resource uh, library with resources from many giving struggles across the country. And you are going to meet an incredible community of people uh, like you, um, our I know this podcast is coming out in October, so our you know dates for October and November launchpad. We have um, launchpad on Tuesday, October third at seven p.m. Eastern, and also on Thursday, November sixteen at four p.m. Eastern. And on our website, you can even if you cannot join these two dates. Um, you can join any month. Fantastic. Nice and easy. <laughs> and so my final yes. question to you, um, I always like to end with a, a global kind of uh, thoughts uh, question. Um, so where do you feel that we are heading as a global society when it comes to giving? Oh, my God. That is a, that is a big, big question. <laughs> well, um, you know, this is the pageant question. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I am, and I am, uh, I am always an optimist. And every day, I, my heart, my heart, you know, gets full of joy of the messages of we re- that we receive from people all over the world that are, you know, taking action and are deciding to support different causes in their local community. Um, Yes, you know, billionaire philanthropy is needed. Yes, because, you know, we they, they should be given their fair <laughs> share of money. Um, of course. But, and we need everyone to get involved. 
And um, I I have the the privilege of serve on the board of Giving Tuesday, and I am in this chat group well with all the global leaders. And every day, that's how I start my day, looking at what all these incredible leaders are doing in in their different countries, right? From you know. Um, Supporting a uh, 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 women's shelter, um, young people, uh, you know, going and reading to elders. I mean, so many different ways of radical generosity. And I feel that is exactly, I love this, you know, uh, concept of radical generosity that Giving Tuesday uses all the time. It's how can we, all of us, wake up and say, how can I be? radically generous today with everything, not only with my money, with my time, with my smile, with my cow. How, how can I be generous today with someone? I love that. I love looking at, um, you know, I guess it goes back to, like they say, the, the person, uh, each individual and, you know, uh, really taking um, time to reflect who they are and how they can you know, shine who they are to the world and, and contribute, um, you know, I guess what we should be contributing ourselves, um, and, uh, all of that, uh, you know, leading to not only, um, you know, money, but, uh, a changed mindset and, um, uh, hopefully some, you know, great positive, uh, global movements, um, that lead us, uh, to the, uh, right places. So beautiful answer. Um, thank you. Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your time and insight. If you'd like to know more about Sarah Loma Lin, go to philanthropytogether.org. If you have a passion for an unserved community, a social justice problem, or simply want to change minds, contact Project Good Work at projectgood.org to start your project of change today. To our listeners, thanks for tuning in to Project Good, where we're focused on what matters. 